So I'm on. You're up. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, hear you singing. That sounds great. I have a manuscript here. <laughs> I'm, I'm learning what it means to get old, you know, and uh, a forgetter is a very, very tricky thing. And mine is very busy. So a little bit of writing. I didn't preach this way. So take it from there. It's a great responsibility to speak to you who are preparing for serving Christ and his church in this century. It's a challenging time, and yet nothing new in the kingdom of our Lord Jesus. I want to speak to you about what I consider to be one of the most, if not the most central teaching or doctrine of the Christian life. I speak about union and communion with Christ. I came to this conviction by experiencing a revelation of this doctrine in a very significant way. I'll tell you the story. It was in the context of the Billy Graham crusade here in Pittsburgh in 1952. That was 1952, not 18. <laughs> I was a newly ordained pastor of the Central Pittsburgh Reformed Presbyterian Church, and Pittsburgh was to host Billy Graham for several weeks of evangelistic services in September. Now, accompanying those evangelistic services held in the old Reeves Stadium there in Oakland, where they were meetings known as follow-up meetings held in First Presbyterian Church downtown. Now, these came about, I might say briefly, <clears throat> as Graham wrestled in prayer concerning those positively responding to come to Christ, what would happen to them? What was happening to these new converts? He couldn't sleep. Were they growing? Were they being assimilated into the church? And so he had secured Dawson Trotman of a ministry called the Navigators to conduct early morning seminars for those wanting to know how to care for new believers. And the story of the Navigators is one I will not go into, but if you haven't known about it, it's worth investigating. <clears throat> now, Bob McConaughey, an elder in my church who worked for Gulf Oil downtown, invited me to join him in attending these meetings that were being staged to help people follow up those who made commitments. <clears throat> so, when you're a new pastor and an elder invites you, you say yes. So, Trotman was speaking to a packed house. <clears throat> Excuse me. About the care of the new convert to Christ. He brought out an illustration known as the wheel by which the uh, need of the uh, new convert was made. This set it right there. <clears throat> I had this given to me, by the way, 
from a friend who was in the Navigators and, and was up at Penn State where I met him. Anyway, I was fascinated by hearing Trotman. He began to explain the needs of the new believer and how to build him or them in their life in Christ. And now in the providence of God, I had been preaching, I want you to know my background just this much, that I had been preaching for two years when I was in seminary. I had a regular preaching assignment in East, uh, down in Beaver Falls and another one later for a whole year in New Kensington. So by the time I finished and was ordained and installed in central Pittsburgh, as it was called then, uh, I had been preaching for two years, every week. So hearing about the needs of new believers was fresh talk to me. We didn't talk about that in seminary, generally because there were no new believers. Well, let me tell how this illustration helped me. Because when we went to the meetings down there in First Presbyterian Church, Trotman had one of these, somebody had made for him. And he was using it as a demonstration of what he was trying to say. And when Trotman began, he began with a hub. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, the rim of the wheel is the obedient Christian in action. As John 14, 21 says, he that has my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Did you get that? I will manifest myself to him. And 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now let me pause for a minute. I didn't catch it at the time, but that term in Christ was going to dominate my thinking. How... I had missed that in my three years here in seminary, still mystifies me. But that day I heard it. There was something mystical about the term, yet vital. Now Trotman continued to explain the respective spokes, the word, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the word, that if you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Helping a new believer begin to feed on the word was basic. And teaching him how to pray and speak with his God was also basic. And let me just tuck in here parenthetically. I don't have it in my notes. But you know people are giving their lives to translating the Bible so people can read it. Can you see yourself giving yourself for your lifetime just to translate the Bible into a known language? Would you consider that worthwhile? 
Now, Jesus taught his disciples to pray and how to do it. I was to learn how many of my congregation needed to learn to pray. One man who came to Christ, a railroad engineer, finally prayed once, and he came to prayer meeting, and when we had finished, we prayed in small groups. He said with a broad smile, men, that's the first time in my life I have prayed out loud. He was a member of our church, a husband, and a father. The first time he'd ever prayed out loud. The spoke called fellowship introduced the place of the church, including worship and the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. And this acquaints us with the practice of the one another's, characterizing our life together as believers. If you've never done a study on the one another's of the New Testament, do so. You'll find there are nearly 50. Pastors can't do that. That's congregational life. Now, suffice it to say that when a new believer begins to live out the wheel in his or her life, the final spoke almost speaks for itself. The life of the new believer who has been helped to build the wheel in his or her lifestyle in itself bears witness to the gospel. He almost naturally will demonstrate a different lifestyle. The Holy Spirit will begin to change his or her demeanor to actually demonstrate a new witness. Well, I had never heard anything like this. And I decided to learn everything I could from this aspect of the Graham Crusade. One thing that interested me from the beginning was the fact that this implemented a true hermeneutic of spiritual growth. I took my dad, here's a little parenthetical thing. I took my dad sometime later to a conference of the navigators in Colorado during one of Trotman's lectures, dad leaned over to me and said, he was a pastor, had I known these things at your age, my ministry would have been quite different. That remark made me sad, for he was a man of God. I began to comment, uh, ponder that comment, for I wondered what had I missed in my training. After some pursuit, I learned from a well-read friend about John Murray's principles of conduct, and particularly the chapter, The Dynamic of the Biblical Ethic. And he spells it out there. I suggest you read this for yourself if you've not done so already. It answers the questions connected with the dynamic, the power of the biblical lifestyle ethic. In short, the power of the Christian life. I was not sure how to bring a message to you today, but I want to leave you with that insight which led me to a biblical and satisfying lifestyle and ministry. I want to leave you with three or four portions of scripture for your personal pursuit in which the dynamic of the Christian life and ministry are inferred. I'm not suggesting you haven't already done this, but I'm not worried. The first is Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, 
but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself to me, for me. Now notice the prepositions. It's in the flesh and by the faith. Not in the faith and by the flesh. The new believer needs to learn this Christian lifestyle. And the father or mother who has learned this will teach it to her, his and her children. That's where the dynamics is. In Christ. So I leave that text with you. Exploit it. The second text to which I refer to <coughs> you for study and meditation is John 15, 5. Thank you for this, whoever brought it. John 15, 5. <coughs> Excuse me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Now, there's been a lot of debate about the meaning of fruit here. I suggest one give deep attention to what it means to abide in Christ. The text makes no question about that. And again, the concept has to do with the dynamic of union with Christ. Now, the next text, which bears concentration, takes us to Psalm 1, which we sang. An Old Testament reference to the godly man and by inference to Jesus himself. Here the metaphor is also fruit, and however one may take it, it is obviously production and success. Now this psalm came alive for me when I probed into what it meant to be like a tree planted by the streams of water. I challenge you to study that. Now the last text to which I refer is Mark 3, 14. <clears throat> and he ordained 12 to be with him and that he could send them out to preach. Now, I've talked to persons who believed that the Christian ministry was and is a lonely calling. I've talked with discouraged pastors who have felt the pastor to be almost isolated from the real world. But it's not designed to be a lonely task. Jesus ordained men to be with him, which did not take away his private times, but by virtue of his union with his sheep, he developed men who understood purposeful fellowship. I've written a short book on that, The With Him Principle. The pastorate can be a lonely experience, if one fails to incorporate this principle into his vision and practice. I leave you with these things, which opens up a lifetime of ministry in Christ. It's a ministry that flows from union and communion with him. If he has truly called you to this ministry, 
He will be your Well, he will by your union with him grant you the fruit. And I give thanks to him for having revealed to us this precious doctrine. Amen. Lord, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that you've taught us to abide in him. And not only that, but shown us how. Lord, bless these dear brothers and sisters. May all of us be fruitful according to your grace in Christ. Amen. Amen. Do you have a concluding uh, psalm you'd like what, to sing? 119B. 119B. Let's stand and sing Psalm 119, Selection B. <clears throat> Thank <clears throat> you.